Steam is awash with garbage, a sea of trash marked with small glimmers of hope here and there. Digging through the landfill is required to be able to find the undiscovered rays of hope in the rolling hills of gray, but that's what I'm here for. Today, I'm going to sift through the muck so that you don't have to. We'll be taking a look at some of the worst rated games on Steam. This time I picked 10 games that were among the mixed, negatives, and overwhelmingly negatives. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to once again talk about bad games. Before we get into the games, I'd like to once again briefly talk about how I chose the games for this video. Last time, I took a look at the list of the worst 100 games on Steam. I exhausted that list pretty heavily last time and took from it what I could. This time, I had to move on from that list and sort every game on Steam by user reviews. I went to the other side of that list and worked backwards, sifting through dozens of games to find the ones that were the most interesting. Of course, we could have looked at Overwatch 2, NBA 2K24, or Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, but that wouldn't be very interesting. I decided to pick a list of games that mostly no one has talked about yet. There are some on here that are well-known travesties, but a lot of these are undiscovered gold. I also, again, picked a larger variety of genres, so we weren't just talking about 10 psychological horror games that a random guy made in one night with Unity. I also will not be delving incredibly deep into each game. I am not doing an entire video on each project, just a general overview of each game, my experience with them, and some background information on the developer, previous games in the series, and games that they were inspired by. Once again though, I have given each game on this list a chance. I tried to be as fair and impartial as I possibly could, and you'll be surprised to know that there was actually one game on this list that I really enjoyed. With that, let's get into the games. New Life is a game that was developed by Denside Studios, released in 2019. This was the developer's only game, and it hasn't been updated since February of 2020. In that update, they stated that the team would soon be adding a bank heist, but this never came. The game was basically abandoned. So what is New Life? The game describes itself as a life simulator, hence the name. But if this is an accurate simulation, I don't want to live the life that this game represents. You are supposed to be able to become a criminal in this world, buy homes, buy guns, buy clothes, rob stores, or even become a police officer and fight crime. This never really happens. I did try to become a police officer, but the driving is so bad that I immediately wrecked my car and got it stuck. I did take on one delivery job that was mostly unnecessary because you start the game with $10,000, which is enough to buy most things aside from a house. I could buy some clothes and actually buy a gun, but the gun soon disappeared. This would happen 9 times out of 10. The one time I did keep my gun, no one reacted to it, so it didn't matter. You can drive around the world, but there's really nothing to do. You can even rent a very fast car, but for no purpose at all. For some reason, when you click the N key in game, it gives you a shoe camera that follows your shoes while you walk. I couldn't for the life of me figure out what this was supposed to be for. The game breaks constantly. I even created a server and conned someone into playing the game with me. Our cars would often disappear, leaving us stranded in the wild with no way to get back to the town without running. The game would just break in and of itself, leaving me unable to buy anything or really do anything in the world. To get it to work, I would often have to restart the entire program just to be able to move again. It's just an absolute mess. The real problem with a game like this is that it was clearly the developer's first project. Which is fine, but this is just so overly ambitious for someone's first time around. Big systems, a multiplayer game giving people the ability to live every aspect of life is just too much when you've never made a game before. There are tons of other issues with the game, like all the settings not changing until you've restarted the game, even the audio. The game doesn't even let you know this either, you just have to figure that out on your own. It's a dead world with nothing to do that barely lets you play in it before it breaks itself. Like I said before, the game is also abandoned. It was never updated past 2020, 
So it seems like the game was whipped together and the developers just ran away with the money, leaving everyone to either refund or be stuck with this junk in their library forever. There really isn't much to say beyond that about New Life because there just really isn't that much there at all. Dark Years was developed by RSK Entertainment, a studio based in Iran. They worked on quite a few games after this, a lot of which met the same reception as Dark Years. This game doesn't have many reviews, but the ones it does have aren't great. The game starts with a murder, and we take control of a detective who's been captured in one of the worst intros to a game I've ever seen. Oh, I feel dizzy. Bastards! Oh, they have tied my hands so hard! The voice acting in this game is terrible. It's easily one of the most wooden things I've ever heard. There's a piece of glass over there. I may cut this rope with it. I should get to it. Yeah. Every single line is stiff, awkward, and strange. I'm sure this was due to the actor's first language not being English, but it doesn't change how rough it is. If you can manage to actually immerse yourself in the world during a moment of walking silence, that is completely shattered the second that a character speaks. Hey kids, you from around here? So drunk home tonight, I'll hug you very tight. Oh, they don't seem alright. Better not to mess with them. During the intro, we have a very strange QTE section where we can barely see the buttons on screen. The game then jumps back to London a few days before. A letter suddenly appears on the screen, and it'll just stay up there if we don't figure out how to get it off. We have to find directions to a meeting point by talking to people around the city. The world itself is incredibly ugly. The main character model actually isn't horrible, but the place around us looks just foul. The cobblestones on the streets are a strange green color, and everything just looks a bit too cartoony for the people hanging around. The whole environment just feels like if we turn the camera just slightly, we'll be able to see the bounds of the game world, like this was constructed just exactly past where we can see. It feels like it'll fall apart at any moment. Speaking of the camera, it's one of the hardest things to interface with. It's somehow the worst distance away from the main character that it could be. It's in this weird middle zone where it's way too close but also way too far at the same time. This leads to a disorienting feeling when walking around, or especially in buildings. Once we do find our meeting point, we have to break in because the owner isn't home. We have to find a rope and hook which our main character then uses in a very weird minigame to unlock the door. Once inside, we find the tenant murdered, and we have to solve a puzzle to open the safe. The safe code is actually on a painting nearby, but my god, this is one of the worst puzzles I've ever seen. The way it actually works is we left click to find the number that we want to select, and then right click to lock that number in. We then have to left click all the way around again to find another number and lock it in with right click. But the interface, strange camera views, and buggy controls just make this thing a nightmare. You have no idea if what you're doing is wrong, or if the game itself is messing up. It's so hard to tell what's going wrong, but something is going wrong. It just looks terrible, and it's so difficult to interact with. Now, to make things short, after this, your character is framed for the murder, and we switch to playing a detective put on the case. At his apartment, we can't leave because a dog is outside. We have to open a can of dog food and get the dog to go away. At this point in the game, even though the dog had left, the character was just repeating the same line over and over, and the game locked me here, glitching out so I couldn't play anymore. The dog ate it all and left. Now I can go out easily. The dog ate it all and left. Now I can go out easily. I tried this over and over to see if I could get past it, but this seems like a pretty common bug, so I actually couldn't play the rest of the game. I can really only judge the game from the first hour or so, though it isn't that long. From what I did play, it's an absolute broken mess. Everything that people said it was. It's rough to play, poorly designed, it looks bad, and the performances are terrible. It does seem like it was something that the developers were interested in, though. It definitely doesn't seem like a cash grab, or like it was working off of current trends. It was really just a poor attempt at making a noir game. Sick was developed by Michael Derrick. This indie developer made one other game a little more recently called A Simple Request. I did actually play this game, and it does seem like he has improved over the year since Sick was released. I will say, even though Sick is not a great game, and is very broken and mostly abandoned, it does seem like this dev has a passion for psychological horror. 
There also seems to be a progression in development here, like the dev actually wants to get better, and that's not something that I see a lot. Because of that, it has to be noted, because it's worth taking into account. Sick, though, is pretty standard fare for indie psychological horror. There are a ton of junk horror games on Steam. It seems like one of the lowest barriers of entry for new game developers. But like I've said before in other videos, I think it's one of the hardest genres to develop for. Horror cannot be taken lightly. It's a delicate balance that requires the player to buy into the fantasy that the developer offers up. But it also requires some breaking of that immersion, some pulling back of the curtain so that the player can actually be scared. It's a play of tension, fear, environment, and psychology. It's not something easily done by whipping together some basic assets and calling it a day. Sick gives us a basic backstory, one delivered through text at the beginning of the game while the camera flies around the environment. I didn't get very far in this game because it broke almost immediately, leaving me wandering around a map for the better part of an hour trying to figure out what to do. I later learned that most of the game is broken and the only way to proceed is to glitch the game out. I decided that I had seen enough of shaking textures and disappearing environments with little to no interest to be found. I did decide to play a simple request for this review, the next game the developer made. I do want to give them full credit here. A simple request is a large improvement over Sick. I have to say that it isn't particularly my thing, as I'm not a huge fan of the writing or scares, but the game does have its own distinct style. It does try to develop a good atmosphere, and the design is actually really nice. It doesn't just feel like an asset flip or trying to make a horror game for the sake of making a horror game. There's something good here, and like I said, I think this developer wants to get better. Michael Derrick shows promise, and I think with time he can make something really special. Superpower 3 was developed by Gollum Labs. It's the third entry in the series created by the same developer. Now, the series itself never really reached critical acclaim or great success. It did garner a fan base over time and became kind of a cult classic. The first game holds a 39 on Metacritic and the second game holds a 51. Both games had a myriad of glitches and issues, but the third game is something else. Superpower 3 is a strategy slash simulation game. It puts you in the shoes of the leader of a civilization. We can control every single aspect of the civilization. This game also added the ability to create your own leader, but there's only one country that we're gonna be playing. And my leader was Big Bob. I will say this character creator is terrible. Even the UI looks cheap and whipped together. There's no style to the sliders and adjustments. It's all just so bland. It feels like it wasn't even moved or changed after it was put into the game. The game itself is incredibly difficult to interface with. Once you even figure it out, it still barely makes sense. We can control culture, economy, politics, and military. We can adjust the budget for literally everything and change how much research we partake in or how much taxes we charge. The goal of the game depends on the scenario that we pick. Certain ones will see us trying to defuse situations like World War III, and the sandbox one will just allow us to do whatever we want. The real problem with the game, though, is that there's just too much here to adjust. There are way too many options, and most of the game takes place in menus and sliders. It almost feels like one of those sports manager games, where we're just changing names and tables and watching numbers go up or down. I can imagine that there is a crowd for this type of game, and I'm no stranger to the strategy or simulation genres, but this just doesn't do it for me. There's no soul here, no silver lining to be found. The game is also incredibly buggy and has its fair share of issues. It also just aesthetically looks terrible, incredibly outdated for how recently it came out. I did go back and play Superpower 2 to see if there was a large disparity in quality, I will say that the PC port of Superpower 2 is terrible. It doesn't even have full screen mode, so we're almost always forced to play it in a small window. The game itself is fine, but it really shows its age. I do think that it's probably more fun than Superpower 3, but I wouldn't really play either of these games. I think the failing point of Superpower 3 is that it failed to listen to its community. This game was never going to garner a massive audience. It was never going to appeal to a huge crowd. Because of that, they should have listened to the people that actually followed their series and given them what they wanted. 
But because they listened to no one, the game appeals to no one and has a nowhere place in the history of its own series. Widower's Sky was developed by Walio. This was their first attempt at making a game, and from what I could find online, it seems that this was made by one dev on their kitchen counter. Widower's Sky doesn't have many reviews, but most of them are negative. Now, I will say that the game has been updated since most of these reviews have been posted, and most of the issues that people complained about have been fixed. The main problem that people had with the game that there wasn't a great explanation for the controls of the game. In the second and first updates, the tutorial was expanded and things were made much more clear. Now, what actually is Widower's Sky? Widower's Sky sees us playing a father carrying his son on his back. Our goal is pretty simple, to make it through each level, solving small puzzles and protecting our son along the way. We can play in survival mode or casual mode. In survival mode, we'll have to make sure we hunt and feed our son, and also let him rest in tents. In casual mode, we don't have to worry about this. Now, I will say that I do not think Widower's Sky deserves a negative score. The game is very good. It does have its issues, so it isn't perfect, but it is very good for a solo developer's first outing. First of all, the writing is fantastic. It has this very surreal feeling, as if someone is telling us a story from a past life. And so it went. We had never seen conflict. Ego of the state felt like Kashmir, a planet full of the greater kind, walking straight for the tripwire. The performance by the narrator is also great. The read just feels so full of emotion and substance. It sets the tone for the world and the story that we find ourselves in. The game itself evokes a feeling of discovery, of true exploration. The game has open areas, but it never feels like we need to go to different waypoints to achieve our goal or gain collectibles. The game just naturally encourages us to wander about the world. We also have a sort of glide that happens when we wander off the side of a cliff. We immediately start gliding so it never feels like we have to jump or hold a button, it just happens. It's also simple and just feels great in the hands. The visuals are stunning and the world looks beautiful. Most of the game sees us wandering in a new area trying to avoid enemies. We can also use our bow or laser to attack them. We can hunt for food and then cook it to feed our son and let him rest every once in a while. The best part of the game is really just the entire package. The style is incredibly calm, and the entire aura just quietly screams wandering. It's such a fantastic aesthetic and ecosystem. If this game looks like your thing, I would highly recommend checking it out, with the caveat that there are some slight issues and you will feel its brief age just a little bit, but the game really is enjoyable. The developer had one more game coming out called Drift Master, but it seems it never released. There hasn't been any more updates on the production. This makes me a bit sad because Widower Sky is a genuine gem and doesn't deserve its spot on this list. It's something that more people definitely need to experience, so go check it out if it looks interesting to you. Enchanted Portals was developed by Zixo Game Studios. Clearly, as you can see, Enchanted Portals was heavily inspired by Cuphead. The developers had a Kickstarter to get the game funded, but they didn't reach their goal. They originally wanted $128,000 and only received $20,000. Regardless, there was some hype around this game. Most were hoping for another game to fill Cuphead's shoes, supplying more content in the meantime. Enchanted Portals does not fill those shoes. Now, before we talk about Enchanted Portals, let's talk about Cuphead. I played Cuphead for this video. I had never really played it before, mostly because I am god-awful at these types of games. I only originally planned to play the first world or so of Cuphead, and just ended up playing it for hours and hours. This game is so wildly good. The controls are perfect, and the fights and levels are well-crafted. The game is known for its challenge, and that is definitely here. But most mistakes end up feeling like your fault, rather than the games. The style, aesthetic, and writing are all on point, it feels incredibly unique, clearly taking inspiration from classic black and white age cartoons. Cuphead is one of a kind and owes a lot to classic platformers of the older eras, but refines everything that those games did to a new level. Now, Enchanted Portals doesn't really do any of this. In comparison, it feels like a Flash game. 
The game is incredibly slow compared to Cuphead. This is due in part to the level design, enemy design, and the mechanics in general. In Cuphead, we shoot enemies with projectiles and can change out the style of the projectile with a tincture, and we can also use X powers once we fill up our bar with successive accurate shots. In Enchanted Portals, we shoot enemies with our wand, but this wand can change between three modes, ice, fire, and a green that I would assume is poison. Some enemies in the game do not have an associated color, so they can be killed with any mode, but most do have a colored shield. This means that we have to kill them with that matching color, which also means switching between modes in the middle of combat. This slows fighting down to an incredible degree. This removes all fast-paced action from the game and means walking forward until we see an enemy and stopping to switch to a different attack before engaging with said enemy. Also, each level doesn't see a huge variety of combatants for us to fight. Each level has maybe one or two different variations of enemies that are repeated throughout the entire thing. This results in us fighting the same foes over and over again, making each level a slow slog to progress through. We also can't rush through levels, we have to take it slow to make sure we aren't overwhelmed with projectiles, but the enemy's attacks aren't that interesting, so the game becomes about patience rather than skill. Not to mention the game's aesthetics, it just looks very poor, animations are very simple, there's not a lot of style here either, the game does travel to different areas in the later stages, and I like the idea of going to different realms, but the design of the worlds and the characters are just not complex enough to be interesting. The controls are weak, and half the time it feels like issues with the game's systems and balance rather than your fault when you die. I think the largest issue that the game faces is that they brought the Cuphead name into it. It's one thing if fans make the connection, but when the creator makes the connection themselves, you set yourself up for failure in a big way. You immediately create a bar, and you have to either meet that bar or raise it. Instant comparisons in the minds of players is never a good thing, especially when this is your first project as an indie developer. Cuphead feels like a team taking inspiration from classic SNES and NES games of the past, but also innovating on that formula and refining the genre. Enchanted Portals just feels like a game that would have come out on those systems, without any of the charm or style that those games had. Now, the main reason this game is on here is because I've been familiar with it for a while. I saw this game shoved down my throat on Twitter for months. I couldn't scroll on my feed without seeing an ad for Hammer of Virtue. So when I started looking through the list of games and I saw it there, I knew I had to try it out. Hammer of Virtue was developed by No Pest Productions, who also made Driven Out and A Bastard's Tale. These two semi-Souls-like games were actually pretty well received. People liked them and the reception was nice. They definitely weren't for me, but Hammer of Virtue isn't even close to a Souls-like. It's a destruction game. You control a character who has a hammer made of indestructible material. Our goal is to destroy the invading enemies that are trying to destroy Earth. Now, the destruction part of the game is fine. It can actually be pretty fun to knock down some construction sites or houses, but the game demands that in each level, we take out the bad guys around the map. This requires us to use rubble or fallen debris to launch the enemies with our hammer. This is cool, like, the first time that you do it, but the ragdoll physics humor wears off in a few short minutes. It grows very bland very quickly. Another enemy is introduced later that actually requires us to use a technique to defeat it. An armored bear will attack us and we'll have to read its advances to properly block and parry, counterattacking when possible. This is fine, but the game also thinks it's hilarious that when we get hit, we're ragdolled down and thrown all over the place. This makes combat incredibly slow, take forever, and have no stakes other than time. The combat isn't good, the destruction is fine, the humor and world are bland, but the game itself is so incredibly unfinished. Now, this only came out in early access on August 7th, 2023, but this game was released way too early, even for early access. There's just no reason to buy something like this in such a broken and unfinished state. 
Early access can be incredibly good for developers to get extra funding for development. Hell, we even saw the great recent success that was Baldur's Gate 3. It can be great for an indie developer to get early feedback, but when a game is in what is basically an alpha, this can really only hurt a game's reputation before it's even finished. This makes a project seem like a cash grab when it might be something else, but really, Hammer of Virtue's incessant marketing, its unfinished nature, and just general poor design and idea make it something not really worth looking into. Infestation Survivor Stories 2020 wasn't always called that. It actually debuted under the name The War Z back in 2012. The game was immediately met with great controversy because the developers had promised features that were not in the game. This led to a ton of backlash and the game actually being removed from the Steam storefront for false advertising. The game was relisted on the store the year after and they had to change their name due to copyright issues, leaving us with the absolute jumble of words that we have today. Now, I remember when The War Z was released, and I remember hearing about the controversy surrounding it. There were a ton of games like this releasing at the time. It was the heyday for DayZ clones. At the time, that's what I really remember this being, a clone of the incredibly popular zombie survival game. Of course, Infestation went the way of every other game at the time as well, and eventually introduced a battle royale mode. But today, the game stands as an empty wasteland. So, there are actually four modes in Infestation. Arcade, Survival, Battle Royale, and Competitive. I could not play Competitive Mode or Battle Royale because there were just not enough people playing to be able to form a game. As it stands, Infestation mostly hovers around 20 players at a time. I'm honestly not even sure how this game is still running. I would have to assume that most of them are whales that gobble up the new skins and loot boxes that this company releases. Both Arcade and Survival are similarly dead though. There were a few servers with a couple people online, but really no more than four at a time. Arcade and Survival are very similar modes. They both see us wandering a world filled with zombies and trying to make it. Survival is just a little more harsh. Even today though, this game would have been outdated when it was released. The game looks bad, is full of bugs and graphical issues, it doesn't work well, the UI is a mess, just the standard fare for something like this. But the real problem is that there's no reason to play something like this. Unless you manage to somehow convince one of your friends to play this game with you, which you shouldn't because that would be a terrible thing to do to a friend, it still won't be great. You'll spend your time looting houses, and within about 10 minutes you'll have a full pack of loot because there isn't anyone else there to pick anything up. There's just stuff everywhere, and it's incredibly easy to get full gear really quickly. And at that point you've basically won, because there isn't anyone else on the server. You could find a car and drive, but driving is abysmal and you can barely control a vehicle. You could also form a clan or hunt the powerful world bosses, but just to get loot that you won't ever use. This game is dead, but even if it was alive, I'm sure tons of other issues would crop out of the dust due to this developer cashing in on trends and somehow managing to keep this game running for a decade. Fredakis, the developer of Infestation, has also developed Nether, the Untold Chapter, and Infestation, the Newsy. Both seem to be failed attempts at the same game, an open world online survival style experience where Nether is trying to be more Fallout 76 and Infestation is just more of the same. I don't have a ton to say about O2 Jam Online. It's firstly a rhythm game. It's based on a previously existing rhythm game called O2 Jam, developed by O2 Media. O2 Jam Online is basically the mobile version of that game, but available on PC. O2 Jam had a cult following and seems to have been popular in Korea, where it was developed. Fans of the game really wanted a sequel, or at least a revival of the series in some way. In 2023, they got that revival, but unfortunately it was developed by Valof. Valof has developed a ton of games you might have heard of, like Bless Unleashed, Atlantica, and Combat Arms Reloaded. All of these games are in some form online, free to play, and have poor monetization models. O2 Jam Online is no different. You can buy song packs for the games, skins for your tracks, and even a subscription that gives you access to all of the content. 
During my research, I did see multiple people complaining about being charged way more than they agreed to though, or even charged multiple times. This isn't the only issue with the game. I mean, just by looking at it, you can tell this isn't some spectacular rhythm game. I've played a ton of rhythm games over the course of my life, and they're definitely one of my guilty pleasure genres. But O2 Jam Online just looks like a phone game. It looks like something you'd download for free while sitting bored on a road trip. Maybe you'd play it once to pass some time, only to realize that you need to watch 30 ads to be able to play another song. The whole aesthetic is just rough. Not to mention that it isn't really adding anything to the genre. It's incredibly simple, and we exist in a world today where rhythm games have to get creative to compete. You have to do something new. It can't just be Guitar Hero on the computer anymore. That just isn't enough. The hallmark of the genre is also the style and the flash. Some of my favorite rhythm games are incredibly over the top, exaggerated, and flamboyant. O2 Jam doesn't have any of that, it's just notes running down the screen. I also think that they deliberately give you the worst looking track skin first, so that you're forced to buy another one right away. You can unlock a normal looking one for free, which is good, but if I was about to spend money on the game, I'd be immediately buying something other than this Fisher Price skin set right away. At the end of the day, O2 Jam is just another example of a series being given to someone that doesn't understand the appeal. The developers tried to cash in on a community without any knowledge of why that community existed in the first place. This came back to bite them though, because O2 Jam is currently one of the worst reviewed games on Steam. Sail and Sacrifice is a very interesting game. It was developed by Cage Studios and released in 2019. The game is an action adventure set on an island inhabited by natives, but also being raided by pirates. We are one of these pirates, but we have the ability to side with either tribe. We can take out the natives or we can defend from the invaders. It's our choice, and this choice will lead us to more activities with said group. We can recruit people to our crew and expand our gang, we can buy ships, search for hidden treasure around the island, upgrade our gear, and even scour tombs for ancient artifacts. Now, before I talk about the cons of Sail and Sacrifice, I want to talk about the pros. I really like this idea, and I think for a first go, it's not the worst thing ever. Cage Studios was really going for something here, and that something, while it can't really be felt in the final product, could be nice. I would love a game where you're allowed to openly explore an island and recruit crew members, a story that splits two ways and leads you down one path, but ultimately, that idea of exploration and wandering is really what intrigues me. It's a good concept in theory, but is an ambitious one at the end of the day. That being said, Sail and Sacrifice is really flawed. First off, like most games on the list, it's very buggy, so many things are constantly going wrong. You'll get trapped in rooms you aren't supposed to, conversation menus will pop up and then immediately go away. It's just jank, distilled into its purest form. The combat alone is terrible. We basically just stand in front of enemies that don't even realize we're there and slash away. We have a light attack and a heavy attack, but it doesn't really matter which we use because the enemies aren't going to attack. They just sort of move around holding their sword out like they're going to do something. Our crew members don't attack that often either. If we aren't there, they seem to do work, but if we're involved in combat, they seem to take a backseat. The sailing is pretty rough as well. Once we get control of a ship, we can take out others, but these ships take off like sports cars. We hold the forward button and suddenly we're rushing around. I know this game wasn't going for realism, but it's just a lot. Then we have to aim and steer the ship at the same time to try and attack the enemy ships. I did explore one of the first ruins I came across. These are meant to hold powerful artifacts. The one that I found was a telescope, which I guess could be useful at some point, but the ruins themselves are poorly designed. The one I explored had a green flame puzzle where we have to use our torch to carry the green flame to other torches, but the torch doesn't seem to have a time limit. It just shuts off at certain invisible barriers. So we just have to figure out which green flame we have to take to specific torches. It's very strange, confusing, and not intuitive at all. 
Like I said, the game does leave you to go about everything in your own way, which is nice, but because there's minimal direction, you often feel lost to wander the world and not really sure what all there is to do. There could have been a better tutorial here to at least describe the scope of the game. Leaving this much freedom in a freshman project is really just asking for all kinds of bugs. Because players can go so many different ways, you can't really be sure how they will break your game. The whole thing at the end of the day really just feels like an alpha concept. If this game was in early access, that would be completely understandable. There's a lot to do here, so people wouldn't be getting scammed by purchasing this. But as a full game, there really just isn't enough here to impress buyers. Cage Studios did go on to make one more game, Sherwood Extreme, that released in 2021. That game was much more successful than Sale and Sacrifice and seems to have a much better reception overall. I think this shows that Sale and Sacrifice wasn't just a cash grab, there was a genuine passion behind an idea there. The team just didn't yet have the skills to carry out an ambitious project like that. Sherwood Extreme itself, though, is a pretty good game, sort of. It's an action game where we play a crossbow-toting character who jumps around on zip lines and swings from ropes, shooting at goblins while trying to make it to the treasure as fast as possible. When jumping, swinging, or zipping, time slows down. The goal is to get the highest score, and this is achieved by killing as many enemies as we can and getting to the objective as fast as we can. Now, I actually like this game. It's developed well, it has minimal bugs, it definitely isn't as janky as Sale and Sacrifice, but it does have some crazy monetization. Just about everything in this game can be bought with real money. There's a skill tree where we unlock upgrades with XP, but we can buy double XP. We can buy skins, clothes, weapons, hats, all with real money. This game even has a battle pass, which is just wild for something like this. There are even level packs for additional content. Now, the game is free to play, so that makes sense, but there's just a lot that requires money to play. The reason I talk about the developer's projects after the game I talk about in the video is because it gives me a sense of their trajectory. If they released another or five other games just as bad as the first, then I can tell that they're either trying to just get quick cash or they just aren't improving. If they went on to make something at least better or inspired, it shows progress. I think Cage Studios have shown progress. They clearly want to make something good that people like. They're trying to do that, and it's commendable. So hopefully, Sale and Sacrifice was just a road bump in their past. With that, we've completed another 10 negatively reviewed games on Steam. I just want to say again, thanks for watching the series. I appreciate everyone who watched the first video. That one did very well, and these are a nice little break in between big projects. Like I said before, I'm currently working on a really massive series that requires a ton of research, work, and attention. I want to make sure that I'm doing this series justice in my videos and make sure that I'm giving it the time and words that it deserves. Because of that, it's good to upload these videos and one-off retrospectives in the meantime so that there isn't a three-month long wait. If you'd like to see another one of these videos and you have a particularly terrible Steam game that you'd like me to play, make sure to note it in the comments below. Bye, Dad.